Hey, everybody, what's going on? It's Aslan Hunchavani joined by Corey Clark. We are with Link Jarrett, the head baseball coach for FSU. Thanks for joining us here. Hit the thumbs up. Subscribe to our YouTube channel as well. Uh, this is also part of the Wake Up War Champ podcast. Coach, thanks for taking time out. We know it's a super busy time for you here as the offseason starts gearing up with everything going on with the recruiting scene. Um, looking back on the season, Coach, you guys started off 11-3. and three. Uh, You had a really impressive weekend out in Fort Worth taking down TCU, who ends up winning the Big 12 Conference Championship. They're regional bound. Um, such high hopes, things obviously did not go according to plan. Is there any value in looking back at this previous season, identifying what went wrong and then using that to, to move forward? Or do you kind of just, I don't know, flush this one away and you know what needs to be done and just move ahead? Well, I mean, there's a lot of layers to that. Um, clearly when we had Wyatt in the role, whatever role we want to use Wyatt, that that hurt a little bit when he was out. I mean, that was clearly our most dynamic piece, whether he started or relieved or a combination of the two. So I think when you see some of the early season successes, like guys were in different roles on the mound and his loss was crippling. Um, the team was very young. So when you ask if there was benefit to this season for the freshman and sophomore laden roster to go through the most difficult schedule in college baseball, there's tons of benefits to that. The wins and losses, yeah, very difficult on everybody. For these young guys, you can go Tibbs, you can go Ferrer, you can go Cam Smith, you can go Whitaker, Bowmeister, you can even go Armstrong, you can go Kirkland, who had never pitched before. You could go Benny Barrett and Jamie Arnold. You can't put a price on the value of going through this season, whether this season was difficult or whether this season would have turned out to be really positive for those young guys. That experience is something that you cannot replicate. And it was so nice to see some of those young guys develop into the pieces that we know they need to be as we move along. Some of these young guys were in roles, quite frankly, that they probably were not quite ready for. But this is what we had, and we used them in the best possible way we felt to try to help navigate clearly a, a difficult time. So wins and losses, I know it wasn't good. Experience for them, learning some of the things we're trying to do from a systematic standpoint, so valuable. Link. The way college baseball, well, the way college athletics is now with the transfer portal and, and NIL and everything, um, roster turnover can be something that even in the sports that are not used to it can be uh, heavy, let's just say, a lot of roster turnover. Baseball is a sport that kind of can have some roster turnover and has over years. Kids will go to another place. They'll look for another uh, opportunity. What do you expect this team to look like next year? The roster, do you think it's going to be? 14 different kids, 18 different kids. Do you have a number 50% different go, yeah, Corey, going into 2024? Yeah, Corey, I, it's hard because there's 3,250 players in the portal when I walked out of Rich and Chuck's office. 3,250. Right. This is round one. Right. This is, this is not even close to where this is going to end up in three weeks. It's not because you have a lot of teams still playing. There were teams that just had their exit meetings this morning in some cases. So the transfer part is whether we agree with it or not in college athletics, we are all dealing with it. Softball is going to deal with it. Football. The difference in baseball is the draft affects the incoming class and your junior college recruits and any transfers that are juniors and your current team. So. It's hard for me to predict where the roster lands. There are simply too many variables. Clearly, the roster has to be athleticized. Like, we have to find some pitching depth. We have good JUCO arms coming in. We have a nice freshman class coming in. Can we retain Bowmeister through the draft? Like, there are some things that are hard to nail down right now in terms of roster. There's some really nice pieces on our team that clearly will be back, you know, with Tibbs and Ferrer and Smith and Whitaker. And, you know, you hope Andrew Armstrong gets back and Arnold and Barrett. Like, they're they're good pieces. Diamas. Now, I know he was hurt, so there's times, like, yeah. the season ended, he wasn't out there, and he wasn't out there the middle part of the year, essentially the 
that middle stretch. But there's some good pieces. Now, what is available to supplement that? Do you add some age, some experience? We were drastically short left-handed bats, critically short. Without Nander and Vincent trying to switch hit, we would have had one left-handed hitter in Tib, which is not ideal. So you start to think of the options as the portal world keeps growing and and you do your best to present uh, a template to them to find a way to play at Florida State if that's something they are interested in doing. And where the roster lands is is really hard with all of those factors in play right now. The draft is July 9th, so it's way too late. It's just on any college coach recruiting with a draft that's that late in the summer, and then they don't have to sign till the end of July, the signing date right. with the professional teams that drafted you. That's how long this goes for us, the way this template has been created. And I would imagine you think you said there were whatever 34, 3,500 kids already in there. Well, that probably doesn't include most of the really, really good teams because they they're still playing. Um, they're they're about to start. So you're you're probably talking another thousand, twelve. Like you don't even know. Like I guess my my question to you is, you, maybe you don't want to. A kid might look like the best option available right now, but he isn't because you don't know what option is going to be available in a week or two weeks, right? As a part as a as trying to recruit out of the portal. Yes. I don't know where, what number we get to in, in the portal. I, I don't know. I know we have done very nicely here in the last 24 hours with this. Oh. And I think that will continue. Um, it is not easy. And there are a lot of schools that are interested in the upgrading of the roster. And that's, in part why you see 3,500 players in there because coaches are trying to do it. The players are trying to see what's out there. We see it in all the sports and um, that it's very difficult to nail down like exact roster situations. And as a first year coach, by rule, we have a little flexibility with the roster and I've been through that a couple of times. So, you know, this is, this is a period of time in athletics where you can try to make some, some improvements to the roster and, become more athletic, we, we must address the pitching depth and the dynamic part on the mound that gives us a little more horsepower. Clearly, we were short there, and we have to be more athletic defensively. The pitching and defense goes hand in hand, so we're trying to address some of those things I, as we talk. I, I broke free from the staff. We are in the middle of exactly that, and it's going to continue for the next two months. Coach, how do you weigh then, I guess, you know, one in the hand, if it's a kid that's in the portal right now with, you know, a bird in the bush, if it's a kid that might end up in Omaha here in a few weeks, uh, is it dangerous to look at a kid and be like, he's good enough? Or, I mean, how patient do you need to be and and how will you end up ultimately working out that kind of calculus in your head? That's the trickiest part. Like when you feel like you have a chance to upgrade, you do it. And then if there's another upgrade available in six days, then you try to do that. It's not, it is not easy. It is not an exact science. And then you have the draft. So this is, this is the trickiest part of college baseball. The X's and O's, the team, the season, that is, I think what most people envision as coaching, but we are essentially front office general manager, like scouting director and salary cap coordinators to manage the world that we're in. It is, we talk about there's evaluation of when we're looking at these players, are we looking for certain traits and where do they fit on the field positionally? Then the recruitment is how do you convince these players that Florida State is the school for them, you know, with your scholarshiping, and with their opportunity to play and their opportunity to develop. So this is, you have evaluation, you have recruitment. Those two things parlay it into them coaching the right group and the right roster to have a winning college baseball team. So this is, this is huge. Leek, when, when you look back on the on, on the season, I mean, as Aslan said, you started out well, and I thought you closed well. You, I don't think you closed well. You did close well. Um, you beat the number one team in the country on a walk-off. 
you won your last road series. I think you won four out of your last five games. That middle stretch of two and twenty-two. I guess what what did you learn about yourself as the Florida State baseball coach, or what it's like to be the Florida State baseball coach during a stretch like that? That quite frankly, the program hadn't seen, and I I don't know if it had ever seen a stretch quite like that. What what did you learn about the team and about yourself as the Florida State head coach? Well, I learned that when we had a couple, like Diomez, I think was a, a piece there that, gosh, if we could, if we could have had him, he smashed yeah. his finger bunting that, that hurt. And then he battled an ankle injury. And then at the end, I know that was, that was late, but that hurt. And we, our depth showed itself, you know, we couldn't absorb Crowell and clearly it was hard to, to handle Diomez not being there. So it was an indicator of, we, we didn't really have the depth that we needed to absorb some of those pieces. And that middle part of this, when you look at the schedule and just the way the schedule was constructed and where we went and who we played, it was, it was very difficult. I learned that these guys continued to fight and work at it and came out better on the other side of it. Now, when you say we finished, well, we, we played better towards the end. I, I still don't think it was the type of, output in baseball that we need to play obviously down the road here but this could have been really it was tough but coming out of that sway in the middle and you see some of the younger guys really start to figure it out and some of the pitching I think when we tried to fight through Kirkland early on people probably were asking why why do they keep running why are you running him out there well right. we ran him out there because we saw the potential to be what he was toward the end of the season. There was no other way to work through it. And we didn't have anyone else with that kind of capability. So you see that at the back end and you see Armstrong kind of figured out and you see Bowmeister figured out and you see Whitaker starting to learn what it's like to go deep in starts. Um, and then you see Oxford totally transform like his ability to manage the outing. So that's what I learned through the tough part. And it was nice to see some some wins toward the end of the year. But yeah, the middle part, I to learn how important like roster construction and depth and athleticism are, like that's what I learned in the middle. And it was it was challenging. And to try to keep the guys, you know, when are you trying to be very positive with them and when does the messaging need to be something different when clearly things were not going well? That's something that I had not really been through and you learn it and, you know, dealing with, with you guys before and after games, like those are, those are pieces and addressing that and explaining it. Those are things that I learned. So, and now you learn when you're sitting here with these recruiting decisions to make the gas pedal is down to try to make sure the roster has a little bit better flow and look to it and a little more balance and athleticism. On Monday when they're doing the selection show, uh, you know, I've been I've been covering Florida State for 15 or 16 years. Clearly, I'd never taken like a Memorial Day off to not watch the selection show. I know you're a self-motivated person anyway. You don't get to where your lot in life if you're not. Is there any extra motivation? I don't know if you watched a single inning of the ACC tournament. I don't know if you watched the selection show. I don't know if you know who the regional hosts are. Because I know you're concentrated solely on Florida State, but is there an extra motivation this time of year because you're not getting ready to play in that stadium behind you? Well, the motivation right now is the recruiting. Yeah. So I'm the ACC representative for the selection committee. So oh, I so you probably do know. <laughs> well, I know way too much. So right. I, you know, I'm having to evaluate every team and every team that we played and the teams that are in the other five conferences that we evaluate for the selection committee. It's very difficult. And to think back, I've done this six years, I guess, and it hasn't gone real well for us at Notre Dame. <laughs> for right. my son, when his NC State team didn't get sure. in last year, um, we should have hosted. We should have been a national seed. We should have done this. And you're trying to explain the metrics of each one of these teams. And, um, clearly it was not enjoyable this year to be on those calls. I did the best I could do. Um, we broke it down. You kind of rank how you feel this side of the country stacks up more or less. We don't rank the SEC. They're not in our regional call. 
grouping that we have. Um, and you, to be honest with you, the last several years, I haven't watched the selection show. I just look where we were going and who was in the regional, and I didn't even watch. So I didn't watch it this time. I just knew so much going into it that my attention clearly needs to be on like what our staff is dealing with right now, and that's navigating this this recruiting. And if there's a positive side to what we're having to deal with not playing, it's that you get to try to focus solely on roster management. Coach, last one for me. We'll let you, well, Corey, get one in here, and then we'll let you go. Thanks again for spending so much time with us. Uh, but when you mentioned the fact that you and, and Rich and Chip and, and, you know, Chuck, you guys are everything. You guys are the GMs, you're the player personnel, you're the scouting directors, capologists, uh, you know, all these other sports on campus, they have get full cost of attendance. Baseball, historically, obviously, well known that baseball does not get full uh, cost of attendance. It's, you know, it's 12 point whatever fractionally. This early stage of you being in the, in the portal and talking to kids, how – important is nil when you're not able to offer full scholarships to all the guys in your dugout uh have you felt uh, any kind of uh, momentum in terms of what that can do for helping build rosters well i know the rising spear group has been great for all of our sports and and their efforts to help because nil is a real part of college athletics it you guys know that better than anybody with the the depth of coverage you provide on all the sports it's it's real we have 11.7 scholarships in baseball we can have 40 players on the roster next year. And there are minimums like that you can offer. It's very difficult. That part of it alone is very difficult. Then how many of these guys we signed in high school are not going to show up? If Arjun Namal is drafted in the first 12 picks of the draft and doesn't show up, like how much scholarshiping is he on? What does that free up? What does it do to your roster? So just the scholarshiping alone is so challenging. And then the the length of the scholarship agreement, that's a whole nother piece and how you balance that and how you maneuver aid around then when you get into the NIL world. I mean, clearly that's that's a life of its own and we've never seen anything like it in college athletics, but it's real and it's here and we have great support and people that have helped with Rising Spear and helped fund it, they're helping better our program. Link, my, my last question was more about the uh, the stadium that's right next to you. I don't know what kind of relationship you have with Lonnie. I know you probably watch that team from afar. Well, not that far. You're pretty close to that stadium. But what is it like to watch that softball uh, program do what it does? Um, any inspiration you can draw from maybe what that energy was on Friday night when they beat Georgia to go to the Super Regionals? Just – I know they're different sports with all their different obstacles, but what is that? What is that like to be that close and watch Lonnie and her staff do what they've done? Well, Lonnie, Lonnie's a pro, and they run a professional style group. Like it's their team; they're team oriented. You can see it: the energy, the way they play, the togetherness, the enthusiasm, the detail, the athleticism, the balance. They're really, really good. Like it's a championship level program and you can see it and I think you can see it when you see that in any sport like it jumps out at you and that type of environment is breeding I want to go watch and the people that are in the parking deck and everybody's gathered around and the energy you feel it and that's what championship level programs do and she has done a beautiful job their staff has put together a wonderful a wonderful team their girls play hard and with energy and it's really fun they're gonna go win the national championship there you go. There you go. Speak into existence. Coach Link, Jared, thanks so much for joining us here on the program. We certainly appreciate it, and uh, best of luck uh, with all the phone calls and the text messages and everything that goes into that. Thank you, fellas. Thanks, Link.